Strangely strange but oddly normal Hi, my name is John Downs and welcome to the Beltane 2012 episode of On The Track. Unlike the last couple of Aprils, the weather at the moment is bloody awful. I'm also not very well, which is why I'm inside with the cat, not outside trying to film and brave the elements. We've had quite an interesting month, and the most important things have been the research that we've been doing up at Huddersfield Woods. The continuing saga of the CFZ trail cams, well, um, continues. In last month's On the Track, we showed you how Graham and Richard, together with my old friend Richard Muirhead, and Saskia England, a young lady who has interned for us for a week on a sort of week's work experience, and I still find the idea that somebody does work experience working with people who've done their best never to have proper jobs quite amusing. However, I digress, and the four of them went out to Ashcroft Farm, and they brought back the trail cameras that had been up for the previous month, and we got all sorts of interesting pictures. Sadly, none of the big cat. So a couple of days later, we put them out again. This time on the opposite side of the road, still on private land owned by Ashcroft Farm. Now, over the years, there have been a great many sightings, between 8 and 10, of what appears to be a big cat-like animal crossing the river at this point, and we were hoping that we would be lucky and we managed to pick the cat up on our cameras. The fourth camera we put up on public land just round the corner. We had our fingers tightly crossed because for the first time we weren't putting the cameras up on places where we had a fairly good idea that they wouldn't be stolen from. This time it was up on public land and anything could happen. In fact, very little did. We only left it up for 24 hours but we got quite a few photographs of a tractor going past a photograph of Karina walking Prudence and only about half an hour after the CFZ party had gone back to base this large and confident dog fox strolling along the road in broad daylight or pretty well broad daylight as if he owned the place. We only left this camera up for 24 hours being worried about its safety and this was the only picture of a wild animal that we managed to get. But let's get back to the other three back at Ashcroft Farm. What we left them up the best part of a month and I went back to collect them. This time down. accompanied yeah, by Carl Marshall, a new CFZ uh, volunteer who is rapidly becoming indispensable to what we do. Right, here we are. Back to pick up the camera traps one month later. I'm hoping this one near the water has got an otter. That would be nice. It was a mildly complicated job, but they did manage to get all three of the trail cameras back. None of them had been stolen, and we took them home. But would they include pictures of an otter? Would they include pictures of a big cat? Well, yes and no. Yes, it did contain pictures of an otter, which made Richard and me very happy indeed. But no, no picture of a big cat. But there were some interesting pictures of roebucks. Both at Ashcroft and at Walland Farm over the winter we took quite a few pictures of red deer. But these are the first pictures that we've managed to take of their relative, the roe deer, the other indigenous British deer species. Roe deer are much more secretive, indeed cryptic, than red deer. And it doesn't take too much of a paradigm shift to imagine that somebody driving along the road not expecting to see one sees one of these little deer slinking along and thinks, goodness me, we've just seen a big cat. But I know two of the witnesses personally and they're both very, very knowledgeable country people and I trust their judgment. If they say they saw a big cat, they probably saw one. 
I don't think that what they saw was either a roe deer or an otter, so back to the drawing board. We have decided that any time that the cameras are not out is wasted time. All it cost us is a few quid's worth of batteries, so the cameras have been put out again into another location in the vicinity, and we'll let you know what happens next month. Right, we've got something here. Uh, initially I thought it was excrement. Looking at it closer, it looks more like an owl pellet, but it's huge. It's bigger than any owl pellet I've ever seen. Uh, I mean, in order to have done something so large, it must have been an eagle owl. If it is an owl pellet, it could just be excrement that is very high in hair. But it is very odd looking, so we're taking it back for examination. Get rid of this straw. On a piece of waste ground near Huddersford Woods, we found what at thir first we thought was some excrement. It turned out to be a gigantic owl pellet, larger than any I've seen before, and I've dissected many owl pellets. We measured it at fully five inches long. I can't think of any owl large enough to produce this, except for the eagle owl. This is the gigantic owl pellet we found. We're just going to measure it, see how large it is, and then we're going to dissolve it in a bicarbonate of soda. Unfortunately, it broke into three when we tried to pick it up, but you get uh, an idea of how large it is. Remember, this isn't three owl pellets, it's one. Very big owl pellet. Oh, it broke into two. I thought it broke into three. My bad. Well, here we go. How it was when we found it. Let's see how many inches long it is. It is one, two, three. It's about five inches long. If the if the end there wasn't curved up, it would be getting on for five inches long. That's bigger than any owl pellet I have ever seen in my life. Maybe you want to get one in front of it. Right, we're going to uh, stick it into the bicarbonate of soda suspension now. And see if we can get the damn thing to dissolve. I think it'll take quite a while. But there we go. I've always found that um, owl pellets make delightful cocktail garnishes. I'll leave that to get a bit ripe and if needs be we'll put some more bicarbonate of soda in if it's not got enough in it. There we go. Despite his revolting sense of humour, Richard is actually a very good scientist and was surprised the next day to find that the owl pellets, or whatever they are, hadn't even really begun to dissolve. So we decided to test the hypothesis whether they were in fact owl pellets. Richard went down to Warren Farm to visit my nephew, Ross Braun Phillips, who keeps owls. And he brought back some owl pellets that we know are owl pellets from two of his captive barn owls. What I'm about to do here is to transfer some owl pellets into a jam jar with warm water and bicarbonate of soda. Now these pellets come from a, a sorry, not a tawny owl, a um, barn owl kept by our good friend Ross and he's been kind enough to allow me to go in with his barn owls and take some of their pellets which we can see here. Now the reason we are going to be dissolving these is to compare how quickly they dissolve with the possible eagle owl pellets that we found the other day because the eagle owl pellets have not even started to dissolve and they've been in the bicarbonate of soda mixture for several days now so we're going to see how these pellets react and time them. In they go and we'll take a, a quick look at the time And the time, as you can see, is 25 past 2. 
and today is the I believe the 23rd of April so we'll see now how long it takes these things to dissolve well as you can see they're beginning to dissolve already look at that I've only just put them in a little shake and already they're coming apart unlike the other pellet which is very strange here we have the possible eagle owl pellets and you see they're much more robust they're not falling apart at all despite having been in the solution now for a number of days I'm going to try putting a bit more bicarbonate of soda in well, as you can see with uh, even with extra bicarbonate of soda these pellets are relatively intact they seem to be much more compact than the pellets from the barn owl and contain much more fur then the story gets even more complicated i wasn't very well that week and so i was taking an afternoon nap and richard graham and prudence went out into the woods they were actually going out for something completely different but they found some more owl pellets. They also found some evidence that something, something quite large, is eating the local pheasant population. Cheers, odd. It looks like an owl pellet that's been crushed down with <coughs> it's, it's got moss all around it no idea well, that's not the owl pellet we were looking for Those are not the ones I found earlier though, those are those are older, much older. This is a decaying owl pellet, it's not the one that I discovered. It's already half dissolved so there's no point in taking this for dissolving experiments, but you can see there it's got a skull of a rodent in it. Ah, skull of a rodent. Yeah, something has been munching on a pheasant here. Could it be our very big owl? I don't know. It looks like these things might have fallen down from the trees rather than been killed on the floor because there's not much of a mess down here. So it could have been eaten in the trees and fallen down. from the canopy. And here is a second lot of feathers. I don't know if it's from the same bird, it's certainly from a pheasant. But uh, it's about 15 foot away from the last lot. Could this be an area that's favoured by a predator for eating its prey? Well, it's taken us a while, but we found these owl pellets again. Now, they're not anything like as large as the last lot. They're only about maybe three quarters of the size, but they look similar in that they're very compressed. They seem to have more feathers in them than fur, though. So I am going to take these back uh, for dissolving experiments. So, here we are again with the what we think are owl pellets taken from Huddersfield Woods. They resemble the first lot of owl pellets, the ones that have yet to break down in the bicarbonate of soda solution, uh, unlike the ones from Rossi's barn owls which broke down very quickly. 
these are very compact and although they're smaller than the first set we discovered they do look very similar but they seem to have quills from feathers in them rather than hair the first lot was made primarily out of hair so let's pop these in and see if they dissolve Now these seem to be dissolving fairly quickly too. Maybe not quite as quickly as um, Rossi's barn owl pellets, but certainly more quickly than the first lot of pellets. Now let me show you. These are the first lot, the very large owl pellets we think may have come from a European eagle owl. They hardly dissolved at all. They're so compact. These are from Rossi's barn owls and you can see a little bone floating there from one of the chicks he's fed them. That's all the, the downy feathers at the bottom. It's separated out into this soup. And that happened very quickly. Here we've got something in between. It's separating but not nearly so quickly as as Rossi's. So we'll have to leave that overnight and see what happens. So why are we bothering to do all this? Well it's a fair question but I think we've got a fair answer for you. It's simply that science is about testing hypotheses. If you don't experiment, if you don't try things out, if you don't test hypotheses then you're not being a scientist. We have been interested in the ecology of the Huddersfield Woods area for some years now as you know largely because of the accounts of big cats that have been seen there. But now we've been presented with a second mystery. Could there be a European eagle owl living here? They certainly live wild in other parts of the UK. And if there isn't a European eagle owl living here, what on earth is it that's making these enormous pellets? We'll come back to this story next month and tell you how the experiments continue. In late April we had some of the worst weather of the year, but I braved the elements in order to go out to a meeting by the Friends of Appledore Library, where I gave a lecture, hosted by my old friend Jim Jackson. Tonight um, I'd like to introduce you uh, to a friend of mine that I've known for five, six, seven years now. Um, very, very versatile gentleman, uh, publisher, author, traveller, explorer, um, graphic designer and a musician. And, um, He'll tell you all about his experience as a roadie with Cockney Rebel at uh, some time. I probably won't. You probably won't. <laughs> <laughs> um, and to take the traveller out, because that makes it sound, and I know I've got a badly need of a haircut, but it makes it sound like I'm hanging around on the corner with a thin dog on the street. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of traveller. Okay. <laughs> International traveller. Um, tonight he's going to talk about the mysterious uh, big cats. Some of which we can lay claim to in... Oh, am I? So I believe. <laughs> I thought I'd talk about something completely different. What did you think you were talking about? Well, I don't know. I was just going to make it up as I go along. Oh, okay. What do you normally do? So, um, could be in for a bit of a surprise tonight. <laughs> and he'll tell you all about it. So, ladies and gentlemen, John Down. I actually did know I was supposed to be talking about big cats, but one of the few perks of an underpaid job taking the mickey out of Jim <laughs> I did the talk because I'm very impressed with what the Friends of Appledore Library are doing. We live in a world where successive governments are eroding away at the library services and seem to be doing their best to make a whole generation of people, young people at the most impressionable time of their lives, functionally illiterate. Add to this the dumbing down of the media and you are left to wonder, like I do, whether this is deliberate, whether a population that can't think for themselves are just easier to control. 
So I will do anything I can to help people like the Friends of Appledore Library who are fighting a gallant rearguard action in favour of literacy. I also had Richard with me, and Richard and I always make a bloody good double act. Uh, all of them describe the same animal. I've also seen its footprints, which um, are startlingly unlike those of any other ape. I used to be a zookeeper, I specialised in reptiles, but I work with an awful lot of apes at a place called Twy Cross Zoo. Now, you know, who remembers the PG Tips Chimps? Yeah, like that shift in the piano. Up the, yeah. I've worked with all of those, and they look cute then because they were little babies. Now they're about that tall and they've ripped your arm off, given half the chance. Regular viewers of On the Track will remember the ongoing saga of our Alfaro Cultratus. Max, Dave and I bought them at the Live Bearer auction at Redditch in June 2010. We took them back and they bred fairly easily. I was rather pleased with these because I think they're nice little fish that always remind me of miniature poor beagle sharks. Then at Christmas 2010 we had a disaster. A power cut destroyed the thermostats in their tanks and we thought they had all died. Two large females were all that were left, and much to my surprise, in March 2011, they gave birth. Whether these are parthenogenetic births, or whether they had held some sperm inside them from the last mating, I don't know. Personally, I think they're parthenogenetic, which, as I'm sure you all know, means that a male was not involved in the procreation process. But... Look what's happened now. They've bred a year or so later. And we have another generation of Alfaro Cultratus to delight me. And as they are in a tank on my desk in my study, they, apart from prudence, are probably the animals with whom I interact most. And I have found the behaviour of these delightful little fish fascinating over the past two years. Let's hope that the saga continues. Also, as regular on the track viewers will know, we've been following the reproductive habits of the local frog population all year. The first frog spawn was laid in January, but it was all killed in the frosts of February. Smaller amounts were laid in March, and they hatched out, but then the droughts of early April threatened to kill them all. The ones at Kenneland died when the ditches dried out, and we were so worried about the ones left here at Huddersford, the only ones left from this generation of tadpoles, that Karina and I were preparing to mount a rescue operation. When the heavens opened, we had some of the heaviest rain that I've noticed in years. The tadpoles survived. And much to my surprise, tadpoles appeared in another little ditch on the other side of the road. I say to my surprise, because when we first looked, there hadn't been any frogs born there. Was somebody else touched by the plight of the tadpoles and decided that they would do their best to rescue some as well? Or had they just been washed down from further up the ditch? Probably the latter. Whilst up at Huddersford, several times now we've seen palmated newts in the little stream that we've been following. Here, if you look hard enough, you can see one, filmed by Graham. I'm still trying to get decent footage of one in the wild, before just resorting to hoiking one out with a net and filming it inside a plastic box. But that's cheating. And now I think it's time to go over to Karina for another monthly visit to the Watcher of the Skies. I've always felt a curious affinity with this species of bird, probably because for 30 years I was a secretary, and this is a secretary bird. A highly specialised ground-dwelling bird of prey from an older family than the other Old World raptors. It is native to sub-Saharan Africa and is sadly non-migratory, so will never be a natural visitor to these shores. But I think you'd be surprised quite how many completely unexpected avian visitors Britain does have. And that's what this segment upon the track is all about. Bernard Hoivermans himself said that cryptozoology wasn't the study of monsters, but the study of unexpected animals. And in the UK, what could be more unexpected than vultures, spoonbills and albatrosses? Yes, even the kings of the Southern Ocean have been seen in British waters. Two species of albatross have been recorded in the UK in recent years. Not all of our feathered visitors are quite so spectacular, but nearly every day there is something exciting to greet the Watcher of the Skies. Hello everybody and a happy Beltane 
to all of you. Dog, you're hurting my arm. Thank you. Black wing stilts popped up in various counties during April. They are classed as rare visitors to our shores where the bird is known to be an annual overshooting migrant abroad already. That's nice. And some even stayed to breed in some of the counties. Firstly, one was seen at the end of last month in Tecumshin, which left after staying a few weeks. One was seen at Mutland Water in the county of Rutland before it moved on to Lincolnshire. This happened to not only be the first for Rutland Water, but also a first for the two counties since 1987. The bird had relocated from Stand Lake in Oxfordshire, which by the way was the first county record since 1993. It comes from the central and southeastern Europe, central and southern Asia and Africa. It lives on marsh, weedy lakes and flooded fields and eats invertebrates, especially aquatic insects, and often wades in the water above the knee but rarely swims. The bird's legs represent 60% of the bird's height at 23 centimetres long. Yours represent about 2% of yours. Which means it can feed in deeper water than other waders. I lost myself there. It was first recorded in 1684 in Galloway. Your elbow is in my leg. Hang on. On the 17th of April, the highlight was the first Iberian chiff chaff of Sussex. A male at Apoldrum near Fishbourne was seen. Its usual habitat is open forest and scrub, where it feeds on insects, occasionally nectar, and some fruit in the autumn and winter months. It was first recorded here in 1972 and is classed as a rare visitor. It breeds predominantly in Spain and Portugal and winters in, in West Africa. On the 10th of April, a Hornman's Arctic Red Pole was found at Sanagmore in Islay in Argyle. This is a rare vagrant to our shores with around 17 records a year. It breeds and resides in northern parts of Europe, Asia, North America, where its preferred habitat is tundra and scrubland. It eats small seeds, especially alder, birch and willow, and in the summer adds invertebrates to its diet. It forages mostly in trees, and it was first recorded in Durham in 1855. The Caspian Tern was seen on the 5th of April in County Louth. This is cut You're fidgeting! Stop it! This is classed as a rare visitor and breeds locally in Eastern Europe, Asia, North America and Australia and winters south to South Africa, Southern Asia and the Caribbean. Its diet consists of mainly fish, occasionally invertebrates which it obtains by plunge diving and it lives on sandy sea coasts and in winter on marshes and estuaries. The first record was in 1825 in Norfolk and if you are to see one you can most likely be between May and September. An alpine swift was seen in County Wilk Wick Wicklow in Kilcool. A scarce visitor, it was first recorded in Kent in 1830. It breeds in southern Europe, southern Asia and Africa and winters in tropical Africa and southern India. It lives in open country, especially near mountains. And it feeds during flight on insects and spiders. And that's it. And now it's over to Jonathan for the regular look at this month's new rediscovered species. One of the rarest birds in Vietnam, the grey crowned Croesus, has just been discovered at a new location in Kondong Province. This significantly extends its known global range and offers hope that the species may not be as threatened with extinction as scientists fear. The grace crowned Croesus is one of the least known birds in Asia. It was first described by a Swedish aristocrat, Count Glyndon Stopel, in 1939 from three specimens collected at an unknown locality by young adventurer Berthel Borjokoran. For over 50 years, there were no further records until it was rediscovered by Jonathan Eames, Lee Trong Fry, and Ngoyen Chu at Chu Sang Yin National Park in 1994. The species is currently considered endangered by bird life. On the 19th of March 2012, professional bird tour leader David Bishop was at Mang Den in Kontom Province when he first heard and then saw a pair of grey crowned croesus. 
According to the US Geological Survey, USGS, a new species of gecko has been discovered in Papua New Guinea. Dressed in black and yellow stripes, biologists from the Papua New Guinea National Museum say the gecko resembles a bumblebee. Its unique colouring and rows of skin nodules act as camouflage for the gecko, which lives on the forest floor. According to the survey, specimens of the new lizard measure about 5 inches long from head to tail. They were first captured in 2010 in Sonalihu village on Manus Island in Papua New Guinea. Hyptologist George Zug of the Smithsonian Institution and Robert Fisher of the USGS Western Ecological Research Centre described the new species in a report published in Zootaxa. The discovery of this new species from deep in the forest of New Guinea is a cause for celebration, adding one more chapter to the Book of Life, says USGS Director Marcia McNutt, according to the USGS release. Now the real work begins. To fill those pages with the wonders of this new creature, its place in the forest ecosystem, its adaptation to its environment, and perhaps even novel strategies for coping with disease from which we shall actually ultimately benefit. A UK Indian team of scientists have announced the discovery of a new species of one of my favourite animals, the Limbus amphibians, known as Sicilians. The animal was identified by accident in the Western Ghats area in the state of Kerala, South India. The specimens were found inside moist soil after digging the shrub-covered bank of a mountain stream. The creature, about 168 millimetres in length and pink in colour, belongs to an enigmatic limbus group of amphibians known as Sicilians. The lead author of the report told the BBC Tamil service that the animal was identified as a new species following extensive comparisons with other similar exam- examples from this amphibian group. According to the researchers, specimens of the novel Sicilian, named Gigenophosis primus, were collected during fieldworks in two consecutive monsoons, first in October 2010, then in August 2011. Co-author Dr Umanen says the discovery was significant since the findings ended a hiatus for almost half a century. It highlights the fact that the knowledge of Sicilian amphibians of the Western Ghats remains incomplete and in need of further study. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for watching. That's about it for this episode. I'd like to say thank you to everybody who has helped me produce this month's episode, including... Um, my beautiful wife, Karina, Graham Inglis, Richard Freeman, Carl Marshall, Dave Bourne Phillips, and Matt Nema Osborne, and of course, the Orange Cat. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. We've got a lot of exciting things in the pipeline, including news of the forthcoming Breed Weekend. So I'll see you next month. Until then, be seeing you. Quack, 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 quack.